All right, what we're going to touch on today is not very much different than what we did last time. Uh, it actually has basically the same elements in it as what we did last time, but it's going to feel probably a bit harder than the other things that we've done so far. Okay? The reason why is the space that we typically work in when we are trying to solve our problems as engineers is typically a 2D space. And what I mean by that is that's the paper you're working on, right? Where you're trying to solve the problem, the space you're working in is this piece of paper, right? Where it's, it's basically got two dimensions to it. Um, and so when you're doing a two-dimensional concurrent force system, your space that you're working in is ideally suited to the space that you're trying to describe that's in the real world, as long as it's a 2D system. Well, it gets a little bit more tricky when we go to three-dimensional systems as opposed to two-dimensional systems. And so we're going to talk about, before we even get into the idea of uh, being able to work in those three-dimensional force systems, let's just talk about how to visualize things and put them on paper to where we try to describe three-dimensional things in a two-dimensional space being our paper. Okay? And so to help with that, I didn't have that many of these, but I have a few of them that I decided to sort of pass around the room. Um, what's that? Okay, well, let me, ask, let me tell you what this is. So look at the little gray sticks that are on this piece, and you'll notice that those gray sticks, if you think of them as axes that are all crossing there at the center, those three axes are all mutually perpendicular, or at least pretty close, right? So it's got this perpendicular line going through like this, perpendicular to that line going up and down, which is also perpendicular. So each one of them is perpendicular to the other three. And that represents basically a three-dimensional Cartesian coordinate system, right? So that part's easy for us to, to understand. Uh, what about this other axis that goes through the middle of this set of, uh, of gray axes here? Well, if you hold it just right, you can kind of visualize you know, let's say this is X, and let's say this is Y, and this is Z. If you point this green stick right at you, right? It's literally pointing right at your eye. And you, it's even better if you close one eye, right? And you look right at the end of that green stick. What is it that you think you'll see as you look right at the end of that green stick? I'll kind of swing it around here so that you can see what I'm talking about. If you look straight down the end of the green stick, especially if you close one eye, because if you eliminate your ability to perceive depth, it actually makes it even more clear exactly what I'm talking about. Okay? It looks like three lines probably, right? And if you see what those three lines look like in this sort of two-dimensional space that you will see, especially if you close one eye, right? Those three lines that you see there's going to be 60 degrees between each one of them if you perceive them in a two-dimensional kind of a way. All right? And this is the basic idea behind a projection that we use a lot of times to be able to draw things that look like 3D in a 2D space of paper. All right? As a matter of fact, those of you who have modeled in SolidWorks, you've probably seen that uh, one of the options for, to be able to display a body is called an isometric view. Have you ever seen that? Okay. Well, I'm going to explain to you here why it is that they even call it an isometric view, and then I'll, I'll show you kind of how it works on a, on a sheet of paper here. You will notice up on the screen that there's a bunch of dots. You see all the dots on the screen? And they don't look like a regular grid, right? They don't look like a rectangular grid like you would see of dots. Instead, these dots um, are sort of aligned, you know, they, they may not be actually obvious even how they are aligned on the page. So let me make it a little bit more obvious. What if I take a line and I draw it like this? Okay, let's say I draw a line that goes from here up to here, and I draw another line that goes from here down to here along those dots, and then I take another line and I go from here down to here. Okay, what you will see on the page is basically the same thing that you saw when you looked right down this green axis to see all of these different axes right here. So the green axis is this thing that's pointing at us right out of the middle of that set of axes right there. Okay, 
And if I put some arrows on here, I could even label them, right? I could say something like maybe this is an X direction, this is a Y direction, and this is a Z direction. Okay? Notice that it's all in 2D, right? And yet, this becomes the space that we can draw three-dimensional objects. Okay? Let me show you maybe the most basic three-dimensional object that a lot of people learn how to draw when they're kids or whatever, right? What do you think I might be talking about? Maybe a cube, right? So let's say I go over here by two, you know, uh, dots, right? And um, let's see here. So that's going over by, I went a little bit too far there. So I went over by two dots. Now I go down by two dots, right? Let's say I go back this way by two dots, two dots this way, two dots this way, and so on and so forth. And before you know it, you have made what looks like a cube, right? And um, it's still on 2D, but we understand what each of these directions actually means, right? Because our brain is used to taking something where we're looking at it, you know, like a table like this, for instance. You look at the corner of the table and you see these lines that go, you know, maybe 120 degrees apart from all each other, all, you know, each one of them. Right? They go 120 degrees apart in the 2D projection that you can see, but your brain interprets that as being three mutually uh, perpendicular lines. Right? And there's, this opens up a lot of possibility for us to describe three-dimensional things. You know, for instance, if I want to draw uh, a part that we will often call a clevis, right? I can quickly do that. Right? I can quickly say a clevis is something that's got like a space in the middle, and it's got these two tongues that stick out to the side, something like this, and uh, you know, kind of comes down like this, perhaps. Okay, and uh, it even lets me know what I should do with that line right there, and uh, this can be swung back like this, right? And we can quickly draw something in three dimensions, right? That makes sense. And it actually, you know, our brain interprets it a certain way, and it's, it's quick to do, and we understand it. I can even put a hole through the middle of this thing. What's that hole look like? Okay. It'll look like an ellipse, right? It won't look like a circle, because we canted it over a little bit. We can stick an ellipse on there. Our brain will even interpret that as being a circle, even though it's an ellipse, because our brain automatically does these transformations and, and interprets it properly. That's a little bit outside the scope of what we're going to talk about in here today, but I just wanted to give you the idea that being able to draw and work in an isometric space like this is a really handy thing when we begin to try to start understanding these three-dimensional force systems. And so that's where I wanted to get started with is uh, first introduce you to this idea of an isometric grid, okay, and, uh, and that it could be used in some of these interesting ways. Let's actually, before I leave this point, let's talk about uh, why is it called isometric? Anyone have an idea? Okay, so someone's picking off that iso means equal, right? So that's right, iso does mean equal. What does metric mean? Measurement, okay, equal measurement. Let me show you what, you know, where that kind of arises from. Look at how big uh, it is or how long of length it is from dot to dot when I'm measuring along the x-axis, okay? What if I'm measuring along the y-axis? Does it look like that distance from one dot to the next? is about the same in that direction, okay? And if I measure from dot to dot, it looks like about the same in that direction too, right? This is a projection that is built such that if you look along that particular line, a length on the x-axis, that is, let's say, one inch, is going to look like it's the same length as a one-inch length along the y-axis, which will look the same length as a one inch length along the Z axis, right? So that's where this idea of isometric comes from. It means you'll have the same measurements in all three of your directions as it looks on this uh, figure, 
what if you rotate it a little bit? What if I move it up, let's say, you know, so that instead of looking at the green thing, let's say you're just barely off of one of these axes. Is that still going to hold? Are you still going to look like you have equal lengths? Like if I measured one inch length along this axis, one inch length along this axis, and one inch length along that, that axis, are each of those lengths going to look the same if I change the direction I look along to another angle? No. So this is a unique perspective, right? It's a unique direction that you can look down this axis and you will see these equal uh, distances in every direction, right? And it's, uh, it creates this system where you can either think of it as being 120 degrees between axes if, you know, if this is our measurement that we're taking, 120 degrees there, 120 degrees there, and 120 degrees there. Or you can think of it as 60 degrees if you count the negative ends of each of those axis, axes. And that's how you project it onto this 2D space. Okay, that's all kind of some background just so you understand and get exposed to this idea of being able to draw things in, uh, in this isometric space. Let's actually apply that now to some force, um, some force vectors as well as maybe just some other things that we could measure in this set of axes. Okay, so let me set, start again with a set of, uh, of uh, axes. Okay. Something like this. And I'm going to again label these with, Z, with uh, excuse me, X over here, Y over here, and Z up here. Okay. Now let me draw a line that I want to represent as being a line that's in three dimensions. In other words, it's not just in any one of these planes that's, uh, that's uh, implied by these axes. It's now just going to be some arbitrary line. Well, in order to make that make sense, I kind of have to count uh, you know, some distances in each of the directions and construct something that makes your mind interpret it as being a line that is the direction you mean for it to look, right? So let me show you what I mean by that. Let's say I go by, uh, I don't know, let's say, you know, one, two, three, four, five, I'll go six units this direction, okay? And from there, let me go eight this direction. So I go one, oop, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, that direction, okay? And then I'll, I'm going to go up, let's say, 10. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, okay? Now, when I've drawn all of that, I can show um, a line that extends from where I started up to this point up here, right? And let me do that in a slightly different color here, uh, or a very different color. I'm going to do it in orange, okay? So let's say I start here, and I go up to this point right here. So you can really see here how long is that orange line that I just drew on the page, like its length on the page. Is it, does it look longer or shorter than the green lines? It looks shorter, right? Now, if you begin to interpret this in three dimensions, is that orange line longer or shorter than the, the green lines? It's got to be longer than any one of the green lines. And why is that? Okay, the green lines are all mutually perpendicular to each other. So if you travel along one, then travel along the other, and then travel along the third, the distance from one point to the other can be found with something that's called the distance formula. You guys remember? Uh, learning about the distance formula when you were uh, maybe in high school or somewhere like that. It's basically like an expanded Pythagorean theorem, right? The distance from one point to another is the square root of the sum of the squares of each of the three components, okay? And so we know that the orange line has to be, you know, in terms of the three-dimensional entity that we're trying to represent, that orange line would have to be longer, and yet on this space it looks shorter than any of those lines. So this gives you an idea of, of one of the things that makes it difficult to represent things in 2D space. All right. So that let's so far I've just drawn lines on this page. Let me uh, 
add something else on here. Let me add a force vector. Okay? And I'm going to add a force vector along that line. Okay? And because this uh, is a little bit of a pet peeve of mine, anytime I draw a force vector, um, I don't like drawing a force vector unless I'm showing a body that the force vector is applied to, right? Because the third characteristic of a force that we talked about is the point of application. We're not applying it to somewhere. I don't even know what we mean other than maybe we're just talking about this general idea of vectors. So anyway, sorry, I'm, I'm a little weird this way. I like to say, hey, look, maybe there's a thing there that we're actually, you know, applying this force to. Who knows what the thing is, but it's, it's a thing. Right, we're applying the force to a real thing. All right, so there's a little vector right there that's pointing up along the direction of that orange line. So here's a question I've got for you. Um, how do I find the components of that vector? And next, let me, let me put on here that these each have a particular, I counted them out when I constructed this, but each of these has a particular length to it. So let's say this is six inches, this is eight inches, along that green line, and this is 10 inches along that green line, okay? Now, let me say that this force here, uh, just to throw a number on it, let's say that this force has a magnitude, what do you want it to be? I'll let you decide. How, what kind of a magnitude do you want on that force? How much? 10 pounds. Nice round number. Okay, so we have a 10 pound force acting along that line. Okay, and I, my question is how do I find the components of that force? Any ideas? Yeah. Okay, so his point is we know the 6 inch length, the 8 inch length, and the 10 inch length, and that constructs this little shape that's in three dimensions. It's 6 wide, 8, you know, long here, and 10 high, right? And I think maybe what he's getting at is that uh, we can construct a shape that is actually similar to that, right, by going 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, and one, two, three. I intentionally did it to where it scaled by basically a factor of two. I didn't have to do that, but I intentionally picked something where you could see that it scaled, each, each of those lengths scaled proportionally as we shrunk that thing. My point that I'm making here is that the shape that I just made in red right there is a similar shape to the shape that I made in green, right? And therefore, if I say that the length of the vector part that I have drawn right there is 10 pounds, it means that I should be able to use my ratios that I've, uh, just like I did for the 2D system, I should be able to do that with a 3D system to figure out how long each of the sides of the, of the red shape are, right? Because that's a similar shape to the green one, okay? So let me actually label each of these. Let me say that this length or this uh, vector right here, I'm going to call that, actually I tell you what, I'm going to give this a name, I'm going to say F equals 10 pounds, that way I can label these other ones. I'm going to say this one right here would be like F sub X, right? And this one over here is F sub Y, meaning the Y component of force, okay? And then this right here would be F sub Z. Okay, and just like we did in 2D, we're using a head to tail type of a construction so that we go from the starting point to the last point and the sum of FX, FY, and FZ, the vector sum of FY, F, uh, FX, FY, and FZ, right, that vector sum is equal to F. Okay? So how do we use these ratios that I referenced just a second ago? Give me an example. Any 
Any ideas? Let's pick one. Which one do you want to pick? FX, FY, or FZ? FX. Start at the very beginning, right? So let's say we have FX, okay? And let's say that I take FX over F. What should this be equal to based on the principle of similar shapes in, uh, in any sort of geometry? Okay, we find basically the like sides, right, of this, of this shape right here, and someone says that should end up being six inches over what? Ah, I think someone said like the length, I won't call it a hypotenuse, but we can kind of think of it like a hypotenuse, right? The orange line right there, the length of that orange line. How do I find the length of that orange line? Okay. Right, just like we talked about earlier, the distance formula allows you to find that. So 6 inches squared plus 8 inches squared plus 10 inches squared. Square root of all that. Okay? So what's fx? Okay. I can go ahead and plug in my 10 pounds since we already picked a value for F, right? I can plug that in right here, and it'll just be 10 pounds. What about units? Does it matter that I chose inches? Yeah, what I've got on the right of that upper equation is basically going to be inches over inches. That's what it's going to come out to be, right? Well, inches over inches is just unitless. My point with that is that what we care about in these cases are the kind of proportionality between the sides, and so we don't care what the actual units are, and it's okay in that context to go ahead and drop the units out of our description of these slopes. Okay, so I'm going to do that in this next step. This is just going to end up being 6 over the square root of 6 squared plus 8 squared plus 10 squared. Okay. Cool. Well, we did this uh, in a kind of a painstaking way for that first example, x. You want me to do another one? Okay, we do it another one. We can do fy over f. It's going to be what? Okay. 8 inches over what? All right, 6 squared, 6 inches squared, plus 8 inches squared, plus 10 inches squared. All right. Or it, probably a lot of you could say, I didn't really even need to do that out in that painstaking way. I could have just said F sub Y is going to be equal to 10 pounds times 8 over what? the same radical we had in the first one, right? So 6 inches, or 6 squared, I should say, plus 8 squared plus 10 squared. So what's the last one going to be? Times 10 over the same denominator, right? 6 squared plus 8 squared plus 10 squared. Okay. Pretty cool, huh? All right, let me actually show you one other thing that I think is, is uh, kind of cool here. What if I look at this same, this very same problem, and let me define an angle, okay? And this is going to be a weird angle. The angle I'm going to define is the one that is directly between fx and f. So it's going to be like right here. Okay, so any, any two lines that meet create a plane, right? So I've got a plane created by fx and f. And I'm defining this angle right here as the angle directly from fx to f in that plane that is created by the existence of that vector, okay? And I'm going to just call this uh, theta sub z, 
or excuse not theta sub z, theta sub x. It'd be weird to call it theta sub z. Okay. All right. So that is a uh, a real, you know, geometric angle, and we could actually do one of these for each one of the directions, right? Like I could draw another angle that went straight from f down to the y-axis, and it would be measured in that plane, right? Does that make sense? Or I could do one that went from z down to that vector. And so these each, you know, we can give each one of a name like a theta um, z or a theta y. All right. Here's the problem. Those angles are difficult to work with. Why? Because they're not lined up with axes. OK. They, are, they exist in these planes that aren't the x, y, or z plane. And so trying to deal with them is difficult because you have to rotate this plane around just to even be in the plane where that angle exists. That being said, let me ask you this question. What is the cosine of uh, theta x? Okay, I shouldn't do that because I'm labeling theta x there. But tell me, what is the cosine of theta x? What's the definition of cosine? Okay, adjacent over hypotenuse. In this context, what is the adjacent angle? or the adjacent side, I thank you, adjacent side. OK, fx. And what's the hypotenuse? F. F. OK, so cosine of theta x is basically that length of that over the original length, right? Or length of fx over the original length. Or in other words, that. Okay, so what we are finding here are actually sometimes referred to as direction cosines, right? What I just, what we just described here with this little fraction right here, right? That is sometimes known as a direction cosine uh, for us to use whenever we're finding these these directions. Okay, that's a, a little bit beyond what we need to know for today, right? But that's uh, another factor, another another kind of item that I want you to just at least hear about that now. Uh, and there will probably be other classes later on where that becomes more important. OK. All right. So what do we do with all this stuff? Why do we care to learn about finding components of forces in three dimensions for a three-dimensional concurrent force system? Let's do an example and see it. OK. All right. So. Some of you know me well enough to know that I like volleyball, um, but probably not most of you. So those of you who don't know that, I like volleyball. I like to play it. Um, volleyball nets that most people play on are about seven feet tall. Okay, And so here is, an, here is a setup where we have a volleyball pole, and it isn't really stuck into the ground at all. Let's say it's resting on the ground at D. Okay, And because it's resting on the ground at D, the ground is not able to put any kind of a moment, apply any kind of a moment at the base of the pole. Okay, it's just resting there. What's holding the pole up is a combination of a few forces. Okay, um, one of the forces that I'm giving you there is 50 pounds up here uh, applied to the top strand of the net. Okay, those of you who play volleyball know that's where the most, the largest amount of force is that gets you know applied to a pole like this. And to make the problem simple enough for us to do at this point, we'll just go ahead and say the other forces that might be applied to the pole, like say by the, the rest of the net down the side right here, that's negligible. Let's just say we've got a 50 pound force up there at the top. Okay? And it's pointing horizontally. In other words, um, well, we haven't defined a coordinate system yet, but it's pointing horizontally. And uh, you can probably get a bit of a feel for where the ground is just by looking at the picture. So the 50 pound force is applied in a parallel direction to the direction of the ground. OK? All right. 
We also have a couple of, of ropes that are applied at point A and extend down to stakes that are put at B and at C. Okay? And as a result of the 50 pounds that's being applied up at the top of the pole, there will be forces that will be uh, applied in ropes B or AB and AC. Okay? And what we're trying to do is to figure out how much force is going to be felt in rope AB, how much force is going to be felt in rope AC, and then how much force is going to be applied by the pole that's resting on the ground. Okay? Um, what I have shown there are some dimensions. So once the pole hits the ground, what I'm showing there is that if you take a line that goes parallel with the direction of the net, right, that's this dotted line that comes along down here, okay, and you move four feet back away from the pole and then three feet over to point B, that's where the rope is staked down, okay, at B. Now we can do something similar. We can go three and a half feet back from the point where the pole hits the ground at D. Okay. But then this side's a little bit trickier. Over on this side, I have a six inch tall curb over there that makes it to where the, uh, the stake at C is six inches higher in elevation than the ground where the pole touches. Okay. So it's a one and a half feet to where the curb is. It goes up by six inches, and then it's one foot over to where the stake is uh, driven into the ground. Okay, but there is a rope that goes from point A to point C where that stake is driven into the ground. So this is our given information, and what we want to do is find those three forces: the two rope forces and the force in the pole. All right, we good so far? Okay. What do you want to do next? Very good. Someone says draw a free body diagram. Drawing a free body diagram for a setup like this is a lot easier if you've got an isometric dot grid. Some of you actually are looking out and you're trying to take notes right now and I admire you for that, right? But it, is your, are your notes turning out real good? Okay. If you don't feel like your notes are turning out real good, unless some of you are like, you know, amateur artists or something and you're used to trying to draw stuff like this, probably there's a lot of others who aren't amateur artists in the room and who are having trouble drawing uh, something that looks like this. It's pretty easy to draw when you've got isometric dots though. Okay, so uh, take that for what it's worth. It might be worthwhile you printing off some isometric dots and having a few sheets of that available in your binder for future reference in case we, <laughs> what's that? <laughs> uh, they actually do sell paper with, uh, with isometric grids, and so you're certainly welcome to do that. You can also, there's a bunch of options online where you can download that and print it out on a sheet of paper for yourself. Yes? I believe we do, oh, this, this problem? Um, I might be. So the question was, do I have this, uh, this problem or anything like this posted to Moodle? Um, not really. Uh, not yet. We can talk about that. I do plan on posting the video of this whenever it's finished, so you can go back and review it if that's something that's uh, helpful. And we can go back and, like, look over. That's right. I'm looking at the camera right now and saying hi to all you folks at home. <laughs> What's that? Oh, nothing. Yeah. Okay. All right. So... Someone said we need to draw a free body diagram, okay? Of what? Because every time you draw a free body diagram, your first step is to free the body, which means you have to know what the body is that you're going to try to free, okay? Now, let me give you a little bit of a hint here, okay? Um, in a lot of these problems that we do right here at the beginning, there are often what we'll refer to later in this course as two force members, okay? Two force, a rope, anytime you see a rope, unless you're dealing with a weird problem where it's like suspended like a, a power line or something like that, a rope is generally considered to be a two force member. What that means is that 
there's a force applied at one end, like in this example, there's a force applied to the rope at A, and there's another force applied to the rope at B, and there's no other forces that, we're, that we care about with respect to the rope. If you find a member where there's really only two forces being applied to it, then those forces have to have a line of action that goes in a straight line from where one of the forces is being applied to where the other force is being applied. Okay, when we start talking about trusses, I'm going to get into that a little bit deeper. But for now, just kind of take my word for it, a lot of these have two force members that compose them because two force members make it easy for me to write an equation or a type of problem that becomes a concurrent force system problem. All right? So the ropes are obvious. Those are two force members because ropes are pretty much always two force members. Okay? The one exception, you know, that I noted earlier being, being noted. Okay, that is like if it's a rope that's hanging. Okay, is there is there or are there any other two force members? Okay, and I'm going to give you even another hint. When we did our example problem last time, actually, it was the first of the two examples, the one that didn't have any numbers to it, where we had the uh, we had like a disc suspended by a link link and a rope. What did we do with that link? treated it like a two-force member, and I gave you a little bit of help when we did that and said there's, one pin, there's a pin at each end and no other force is being applied, right? So you can treat that like a two-force member. Do you see anything in this problem that would maybe be somewhat equivalent to that link? The pole, right? Even though we don't see pins on here, because the location at D down there does not have moments applied to it, okay? And because the location at A up there at the top does not have moments applied to it, right? all the forces have lines of action that pass through either A or D, right? and no external moments or forces other than that, it means that AD is also a two-force member, which means any force that acts at A as a result of pole AD being there has to extend along a line that goes from D to A. Okay, so that's another force that exists right there. And then, of course, we have our 50-pound force that's being applied to the top of the pole. All right, that's, that's all some background stuff. We'll return to the question now of what do you want to draw a free body diagram of? Point A, okay? And sometimes it helps if you actually think of you know, to really do this, like to really set up this volleyball pole, maybe that little point right there is kind of like a ring or something. It's a place where you can tie these ropes onto. You can think of that ring as being the body that we're about to draw a free body diagram of, if you don't like thinking of a point, right? If you like thinking of an actual body, think of that ring up there at the top where all these things are being attached. So good, let me draw a free body diagram of that. Here we go. What do you do first? You draw the body. You free the body. So here it is. Freeing the body. There it is, right there. I'm going to draw this free body diagram. And I've done the first step. I've freed the body. All right. What are some forces that act on this body? Okay. I have a 50 pound force pulling this way. That's probably one of the easier elements for us to think about for this free body diagram. What else? Okay, so I have a rope that comes down something like this, right? And I'm assuming that there's tension in this rope. So I draw it going away from the body. And then I have another rope as well, right? This other rope comes down something like this. Okay. And I should probably name those two things. Would you agree? Like, what do you want to name them? Okay. How about T, A, B? And how about T, A, C? Okay. All 
Are we done? Right, so the pole itself applies a force, and from your experience with volleyball setups like this, does the pole carry tension or compression? Okay, I hear some votes for tension, some votes for compression. If the pole wasn't there, what direction would point A move? Like if the pole collapsed, right, point A would go down. What does that tell us in terms of what the effect of the pole is on point A? It must be resisting that. It must be pushing up so that that doesn't happen. Right? So I, ha I must have this force that acts up like this. And by the way, that is a compressive force that you are going to find in that, um, in that member. So what do you want to call that? OK. Yeah, someone says FAD. All right, I like that. All right, so there is the beginnings of a free body diagram. Right? But it's not everything yet. What else should we do here? Okay, we probably should define some axes. Okay? What direction should I apply these axes? Okay, so you want an x-axis going this way? Oh, I'm sorry, y-axis. You want a y-axis going that way? Okay, I like that idea. So there's a y-axis over there. What you got? The pole is perpendicular. I should have mentioned that at the beginning, but we're going to assume the pole is straight up and down. So we can point that along the z. Okay, then what? An x-axis here. Wonderful. Okay, now what? Okay, someone wants to know if there's a weight that we should add, because there should always be a weight. All right, let me ask you this. Do you feel like the weight is a significant uh, factor here? Like how much does a volleyball pole weigh? A pound, maybe? I don't know, something like that. It's going to be pretty insignificant relative to the 50 pounds that's being applied right there. So I think it's reasonable enough for us to say we can probably neglect the weight and not have a huge impact on the, the magnitude of the solutions. Okay, so let's just go ahead and do that. Plus it makes it a little bit simpler. If I did want to count the weight of the pole, okay, would it even be applied to A? Yeah, the weight of the pole is actually going to be carried at D. What about the weight of the net? Okay, the weight of the net and the weight of the ropes, you could make an argument that those might be applied at A, right? But anyway, we're kind of getting into the weeds there a little bit. Let's assume that we're not worried about the weights. What else do I need on my free body diagram? How many distances do you want to draw the line? Say what? How many of those distances would you want to put into your free body diagram? Ah, okay. So uh, someone's saying, how many of the distances that are on the original figure do I want to put on my free body diagram? because it could make a mess pretty quickly. Yep. All right? So that's a really good question to ask. All right? What do you think would be the best thing for us to do? OK. All of them or just enough of them to make our lives workable, to actually finish this problem? How about this? Because we actually want to represent it well on the figure. Let me do this. I'm going to show a line that's parallel with this line, and that'll give me more room to draw these things. If I want to go from this point right here to the point, this is stake C down here, right? How far down do I have to go? 
okay? I have to go down by not seven feet for the point C, right? I have to go seven feet to get down to point D, but then I come back up by six inches over here. So six and a half feet. So when I think of this, I go, if I was gonna draw a slope indicator right here, I'm gonna say this height component, I'm gonna say 6.5. Okay? And I tell you what, I wanna go all the way down to a, a, a little bit further distance than that, okay? Maybe down to this point right here or even further. I'm going to go down to there, okay? So that's 6.5. How far do I have to go in the, uh, in the y direction, let's say? Okay, got to go 3.5 feet in that direction, and I'm stripping... The, uh, the units off for simplicity here. And then where do I need to go from there to get to the stake? If I went down by six and a half feet, back by three and a half feet, all right, two and a half feet. Okay, so this is 2.5, this is 3.5, and that's 6.5 height wise. Okay. And by the way, you know, I kind of switched my strategy halfway through. It might be more clear to you if I drew, draw this line over here. The thing is, it doesn't necessarily really matter because as long as you go from any point on that line to any other point on that line, the, the size of the slope indicator can grow and shrink and it's no big deal. You just need to get the proportions right. Okay. So, but I'll, just to make it clear, I'm going six and a half down, three and a half back, and two and a half over. Okay? What if I do something similar for TAB? Let me use a different color here. Okay? Now I go down by how far? Seven. I go back by how far? Four. Four. Okay, and let's take this line to wherever it goes over here. And how far do I have to go here? Okay, three. All right. One way of drawing these, and I, I kind of intentionally didn't do it this way to emphasize the point that you can draw these slope indicators. You don't have to draw them the same size as the original given figure that you're trying to work from. But one of the ways you can draw it is to just literally like almost copy what the original figure looked like and start drawing those distances right on that figure. The downside of that is it makes it to where it's not a free body diagram. You haven't freed the body if you start drawing it right on there. But if you try to duplicate more or less exactly what the figure looks like and the figure is drawn to scale, that might be one way that would make it make sense to you. Okay? So, all right. So those are my slope indicators. What do I do with them? Well, first, I'm going to move over here. Because what do you always do with a free body diagram? What's the next step? Why would you draw a free body diagram? What's the next thing you do after that? Okay. Someone says sum some forces, right? And the big heading we can put on that is, for, for this class anyway, are equilibrium equations, right? Whenever you get into dynamics, you're going to get into equations of motion as opposed to equilibrium equations. You'll use your free body diagrams for that purpose. But we have the luxury of saying acceleration is equal to zero, so we get to do equilibrium equations. So which one do you want to start with? Okay. What direction? Maybe I'll say it that way. What direction do you want to start with? X. X. Okay. So I'm going to start 
summing forces, and I'll start with the x direction. Okay? And by the way, a lot of times when you do 2D problems, you got used to showing a little direction that you're going to take to be positive. You can still try to do that if you want to, but I think uh, easier than that even is to just say, I'm going to go by the convention that I established with my coordinate system. So anything that points along the positive x, I'm going to count as positive. Anything that points along the negative x, I'm going to count as negative. Right? If you, if you remain consistent using that technique, then uh, you'll, you will be consistent, right? So you don't necessarily have to write that as a note right there when you write the equation. All right, so now summing forces in the x direction. And someone said they wanted to start with TAB, and I'm fine with that. So TAB, does TAB point entirely in the x direction or not? Okay, I want to pick off just the piece of it that points in the x direction. How do I get that, just that piece that points in the x direction? Okay, so I multiply by uh, TA, or TAB, I multiply by 3 over the square root of 3 squared plus 4 squared plus 7 squared. Okay. What else? Okay. Now TAC, does it tend to point in the negative x or the positive x? Okay. Notice there the piece of TAC that, that is aligned along the x actually goes negative along the x. So I need to count this one as being negative TAC. times 2.5 over which by the way that that denominator that I have written right there that's the length of that rope right in case you're curious all right, any other forces that have x components? Nope. Okay, not for this problem. Now, that's not true for every problem, but this problem, those are the only two forces that have x components. Can I solve that equation? Not yet, why not? Got two unknowns with one equation, so I'm I'm in trouble at this point. But I won't stay in trouble. What um, you know? Which of the equations would you like to do next? Okay, we can sum forces in the y. Okay, so we'll start again with TAB. Now TAB does it point generally in the y direction or the, along the negative y? Okay, so I'm going to take this to be negative TAB, and what do I multiply it by to get just the Y component? Okay, 4 over, it's going to be the same radical that I had up there, right? 3 squared plus 4 squared plus 7 squared. Right? And then TAC, does it point generally positive Y or negative Y? So I do another negative TAC times, what's this factor need to be? 3.5 over, same denominator as the similar term in the first equation, right? 2.5 squared uh, plus 3.5 squared plus 6.5 squared. All right. Any other forces that have Y components? Okay. And is 50 pounds, does it go entirely in the Y? Okay, it does, so I don't need to multiply it by anything. I just need to add 
50 pounds, and then set that equal to zero. Okay. Now at this point, let's actually look at our problem again and say, now can I solve it? Okay, I can, but I won't get everything I need, right? What will I get? The rope forces, right? So this is actually a really good point. A lot of times it helps you out when you're in the middle of solving a, uh, this was especially important on like test problems where time is of the essence. If you realize you've gotten enough to where you can get the thing that the question is asking you for, go ahead and do it, get that answer, and move on to the next problem, right? No reason to solve for extra things that you don't actually need if you're in that context, right? So this would be an example like that where if what you were asked for was one of the rope forces, well, at this point, you could go ahead and solve that and get the rope forces without having to do a three equation and three unknown system. But since this question asks us for all three, it might be just as easy for us to write the third equation and do them all at the same time. Okay? So, what's that last equation? Okay. TAB, does it point in the positive or negative Z? Okay. Negative. And to get just the z component, I need to multiply by okay, 7 over square root of 3 squared plus 4 squared plus 7 squared. And then TAC, does it point in the positive z or negative? Okay, to get just the z component, I multiply by 6.5 over the square root of 2.5 squared plus 3.5 squared plus 6.5 squared. Okay. Does the 50 pound force have any uh, Z component? No, it's entirely in the Y, and so we don't have to worry about the 50 pounds. But what do we need to th put in there? FAD. Okay, FAD, does it point positive or negative Z? Positive Z. So we add FAD. Does it need to be multiplied by anything? Why not? It's the only component it's got. It's entirely in the Z, so we don't need to multiply it by anything. All right? And I think that covers it, right? We said 50 pounds not in there. There's only four forces on there, so we've now accounted for what each one of them would do or not do. So we set it equal to zero. Okay? And what do we have here? We got three equations and three unknowns, which you are welcome to solve by hand uh, if you would like to do that. On the other hand, you also have some, uh, again, some technology at your disposal here that might make this uh, a pretty easy thing for you to deal with. Okay, so let's use that. In under the mode key right here, so if you hit mode. Number five right there is equation, okay? And this one's a three by three, and the three by three is under entry two up there. ANX plus BNY plus CNZ equals DN, all right? And notice there again, the uh, constant term that's not multiplied by any of the variables should be on the right side of the equation. That's the format it's looking for it to be in, okay? So I'm gonna hit two. And uh, what's the coefficient of TAB? Okay, 3 over the square root of, okay, 3 squared plus 4 squared plus 7 squared. Okay, positive, right? Make sure you get all those signs in there. That's actually, the if, if I was going to pick out the number one thing that when people come by and need help with this stuff, it's almost always that they get the signs wrong. All 
right? So you've got to be pretty careful about how you draw your arrows and then make sure that you're consistent getting those, those directions for your arrows into your equations and then make sure you get those signs from your equations into your calculator or whatever else you use to solve for the equations. Um, all right. What about for TAC? Okay, negative 2.5 divided by the square root of 2.5 squared plus 3.5 squared plus 6.5 squared. Okay. What about C? Like the C column of my calculator. Okay, I don't have, that would actually be for the um, FAD term that I have down here, and notice there is no FAD term in the first equation, okay? Which means the coefficient is zero. And where I do need to put, or actually in this case, I guess I don't need to put one here either, right? Because the last entry is the constants that aren't multiplied by any of the variables, right? And in this case, I don't have any of those, so I just put in another zero, okay? So the next entry, I'm going to have a negative, okay, 4 divided by the square root of 3 squared plus 4 squared plus 7 squared. All right? The next one, I'll put in a negative 3.5 divided by the square root of 2.5 squared plus 3.5 squared plus 6.5 squared, okay? And that's it for that entry. That's the second entry in that line. What's the next entry in this line? Okay, remember again, this is for the third variable, which would be FAD. And we don't have an FAD in this equation, right? So I have to put a zero there. And then what do I do with the 50? Okay, got to remember to move it to the other side of the equation, right? Because that's, that's the format it's expecting it in when you enter it into your calculator. And when you do that, it becomes negative instead of positive. All right, and then we get on to our last equation. Here I've got negative 7 over the square root of 7, Oops, excuse me, uh, square root of 3 squared plus 4 squared plus 7 squared. Okay. The next entry, I'm going to have negative 6 divided by the square root of Six point, let's see, two point five squared. Yes, thank you. Didn't see the point five there. Six point five, thank you. Two point five plus three point five squared uh, plus six point five squared. Okay. And what do I put for the coefficient of the third variable? One. And what about any constant terms not multiplied by any variable? Zero. And I'm finished with the population of this little matrix right here. So I can hit equals. And the first item that it will report to me is what? Okay. It's whatever the first coefficients were. So the first answer it's going to give me is whatever I had the variable associated with those first coefficients over there, right? And so 52.45 is TAB. 52.45. Units, pounds. Okay, what about the next entry that it's going to Okay, 57.03, that would be TAC. Okay, 
57.03 what? Pounds. Make sure you uh, don't leave off any units wherever you need them. Okay? And then lastly, 90.24 pounds or so. Okay. Now, for some people who are in the room, you may have done similar kind of problems like this. And for some of you, you may have started to use some kind of a system where you denoted tensile stresses as positive, uh, or tensile forces as positive versus compressive forces as negative, right? So a compressive force is anything that tends to make something shorter. A tensile force is anything that tends to make something longer, right? Like if you pull on something, you're trying to make it longer, that's a tensile force. Whereas if you push in on something, which would try to make it shorter, right, that would be a compressive force. Why is it that that last number, 90.24 pounds, didn't come out as being negative? Okay, good answer. So I had a couple people answer. It's because you assumed it was compressive from the very beginning. And the sign that came out of the answer confirmed that my assumption was correct, right? If that had been wrong, if, uh, if it had really been carrying tension rather than compression, like I assumed, then that number would come out negative, which would tell me you assumed the wrong direction. It's actually the opposite of what you assumed, okay? Very nice. Any questions at this point? Okay. Let me spend just a couple seconds here kind of reviewing this to make sure that uh, we touch on one other thing that a lot of people struggle with, and it's this. Your problems often are going to have you do something like we did here with the height of the pole where we had to deduct off the six inches to get the actual length uh, from A to C in the vertical direction. All right? So here's my thing. Just be careful when you're doing those, right? That's, yeah, a lot of times people make errors in the, in the problems and they feel like they don't understand any of it at all. And really, it's that they made some little error like that and they forgot to subtract it off or they you know, just counted something the wrong direction or something like that. So that's tip number one is just be very careful when you're accounting for these things and try to make sure that you're uh, adding when you're supposed to add and subtracting when you're sub supposed to subtract for those. Okay. Tip number two it is actually very important that you draw a direction that you are assuming for each of these forces, right? That's one of the reasons you have to do a free body diagram so that you get those force directions that you're assuming written down somewhere, right? So if they're not written down, when you start going to write your equation, writing the pluses and minuses in your equation isn't easy if you haven't written it down to where you're uniform, you say, this is the direction I'm assuming is positive, and I'm going to write all my equations consistently with that direction I assumed was positive, right? That's another big error I see a lot of people make is that they think they can go straight to writing the equations directly off of the body, right? And a lot of you may even be successful sometimes doing that, and the more number of times that you're successful, it convinces you that that must have been a successful technique, right? that ever happened to you guys? All right, and then you feel like you did the exact same thing again when you get to the test or quiz, but you didn't, right? Because at some point you didn't actually write your equations with a consistent sign relative to the direction you assumed was positive uh, on your figure, right? If you don't have a figure, it's, it's actually pretty difficult to make sure that all of these direction signs, right, are consistent if you don't have it actually drawn up there as an arrow, okay? Cool. It's not much, just a couple of tips there. No other questions? Yeah? When you're setting up your equilibrium equations, then you want to put everything into a matrix here. So okay. You have to keep the order the same so that your coefficients are okay. Right, so the question is, if, you've, if you're writing the equations on your piece of paper with, uh, you're anticipating that you're going to stick them into a calculator, um, 
do you need to make sure that your variables are in the same order each time? Okay. I highly recommend it. I highly recommend that you do that because your calculator is going to expect them to go in in a consistent order. Right? That's pretty much how they all work is that they, you know, the coefficient that it wants the f in the first entry of the first line had better be for the same variable as the first entry in the second line. Right? So um, the easiest way I think it, it is to get that is to go ahead and when you write your equations, try to do them in a consistent order. So, yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, some of you might even find it uh, helpful to realize that this is a system that is a three by three system. And so some of you might find it helpful to go ahead and do this and say plus zero FAD, which is correct, right? It's just we have the option of leaving it out because the coefficient is zero. But if you want to go ahead and write it out that way, that might eliminate one of the spots where you could make an error getting that information into your calculator. Okay? You could also explicitly write this and say, I realize my calculator wants this uh, term right here to be on this side, so I'm going to go ahead and explicitly write it that way. Okay? If I go ahead and write out everything like that, then all of the coefficients that you need to enter into your calculator are totally obvious, right? So, you know, that's up to you to decide how much you feel comfortable, you know, making those jumps from your paper to your calculator. But, yeah, the, all calculators are pretty much going to want those in a consistent order. <coughs>